After the abolition of the slave trade, the British government began to seek ways to end the slave business and introduce a legitimate trade, especially in West Africa. There was no better place to start than Lagos. The city had been a particularly attractive area for the British, who had marked it as the main gateway to the vast, unexplored opportunities of the interior of Yoruba land. This only meant that if the British were to suppress the slave trade, promote legitimate trade, and civilize the natives, the occupation of Lagos was essential to their mission. At the time, there was a power tussle between Oba Akintoye and Prince Kusoko. Kusoko was branded a notorious slave trader and was seen as an opposition to legitimate trade and an impediment to the general advancement of civilization. He aligned with some war chiefs to usurp the throne he claimed was rightfully his, and after three weeks of what was known as Ogun Olomiro or Saltwater War, Oba Akintoye eventually ceded defeat and fled to Abelkuta where he sought temporary asylum. Since Ado and Ashikba, Akin Shemoyi, Ologun Kutere, Eshin Loku, Akin Toye, and Kusoko were the most active slave merchants in Lagos, transporting more Africans to the Americans than any other king. By 1840, the population of Lagos had exploded, and more than half of the people were either domestic slaves or slaves on the verge of being exported. Males were processed for export, while females were mainly enslaved natives. Thus, the proceeds from the slave trade continued to flow in. Slave money was used to buy the 25 guns that lined the Lagos Island, leading to the king's palace. The money accrued from the slave trade was used to purchase velvet clothing, royal umbrellas, caps, and elegant robes worn by Obas and chiefs to command respect and adoration among their people. Oba Kusoko, in fact, performed something that no king had ever done before. He acquired slaves he had sold from Bahia, Brazil, because he needed their carpentry, masonry, and coppering talents to build Brazilian-style buildings and manufacture European products in Lagos. Around the year 1821, Ajayi, later Samuel Ajayi Crowther, his mother and sister were kidnapped by Fulani slave raiders when they invaded his town of Oshogun, 140 kilometers from the Lagos coast. After being removed from his family, Ajayi was traded for a horse. A year later, the young boy became ill and attempted suicide after learning that his new owner, planned to export him by transporting him to Little Popo, a thriving high-paying Portuguese slave market that was a key outlet for slaves from the Oyo Empire. In modern-day Togo, Little Popo is now known as Anihu. Fearing that Ajayi's suicide attempt would succeed before the next slave trade, his owner immediately switched him for a bottle of English wine and some tobacco leaves. He was bought in Ijebu and transported to Lagos, where he was sold to the Portuguese slave ship Esperanza Feliz, meaning free spirit. As the ship proceeded towards America, he lost hope and prepared for death. However, on April 7, 1822, the HMS Mermadon, captained by Sir Henry Leake of the Royal Navy's anti-slavery squadron, attacked the Portuguese slave ship in a shootout. Ajayi, the 13-year-old boy captive, and some other captives were rescued and transported to the British settlement in Freetown, today's capital of Syria alone. The British started the policy of relocating slaves to Freetown because, 
Earlier on, when captives were handed over to Oba Adele, Eshinloko, and Gezo, or any other monarchy along the coastlines of the Bight of Benin, they were resold into slavery after the British seamen returned to their ships. The Church Missionary Society, CMS, which ran the Freetown settlement, taught Ajayi to read and write, enrolled him at Foray Bay College, and sent him to England to further his education. He was fluent in Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, as well as a variety of West African languages. Ajayi's public talks drew large crowds all over Britain because he was a complaining personality, a highly educated black man, an ex-slave, and an established writer. Later, he received an honorary doctorate from Oxford University. Sir Henry Leake, the captain of the ship that saved Ajayi from slavery in 1822, traveled over to see Ajayi. Samuel Ajayi Crowther became the first black bishop inducted into the Anglican Church on June 29, 1864, in Canterbury Cathedral. Lady Weeks, his English alphabet teacher, was also present. It was a heartbreaking reunion. Being invited to meet the Queen was the highest honour a visitor could receive in the 19th century England. Crowther was invited to Windsor Castle with Lord Russell on November 18, 1851, where he met Prince Albert and his wife, Queen Victoria. Ajayi described his enslavement, the atrocities he endured, and the state of slavery in Lagos as of 1851. When Queen Victoria inquired about what she should do about the slavery problem on the West African coast, Ajayi Crowther replied, Seize Lagos by fire, by force. One month later, in December 1851, the British attacked Lagos. A sea-to-land struggle broke out between the Lagosians and the British. The first concern was the safety of the supply of gunpowder, which was essential to fighting. The efficacy of the artillery force, which switched from using bows and arrows to cannon fire, rocket fire and muskets, determined whether the war was won or lost. Thus, gunpowder was essential. For the 5,000 men firing muskets, a ridge was built among the marina's 3-kilometer length, offering ideal cover. Due to the lagoon's shallow waters, the larger warships HMS Penelope and HMS Samson, with greater devastating force, stayed at a distance. As a result, the British Royal Navy relied on the HMS Bloodhound, HMS Taser and countless smaller boats from the larger warships. Oshodi Takwa, the commander of Lagos Army, had anticipated this. The odds of wiping out the British increased as the impending battle was reduced to an infantry-to-infantry -infantry contest. The Lagosians might not have a chance if the British ships with their 32-pound caliber cannons engaged. To further prevent any ship or boat from having the necessary navigation depth should they move towards the shore, two rows of spiked coconut tree stems were placed underwater, an engineering masterpiece by the locals. The Lagosians then placed long-range cannons on piles above sea level, ready for the Royal Navy. On Christmas Day, December 25, 1851, Oshodi Takpa gave the order to fire at the British ships that had gathered together for weeks under a white flag of truce to plan their course of action. Takpa wanted to lure them into the waiting danger as swiftly as possible. The British fleet, led by the HMS Bloodhound, started to sail inwards the following morning on Boxing Day, December 26, 1851, and shortly after that, Osho de Takpa's soldiers fled. But that was only a decoy. The British were subsequently ambushed by the Lagosians, who murdered one officer and 13 men while wounding four officers and more than 60 others, including Lieutenant Corbett. Osho de Takwa's soldiers captured one of the boats and it was the turn of the British to flee. It was a bad day for the Royal Navy. The next morning, December 27, 1851, the British forces depended on an artillery storm. They knew that they would lose if they stepped ashore to engage in infantry combat. 
However, the presence of their dead colleagues on the ship heightened the ferocity with which cannon and rocket fire erupted from the cannons and barraged Lagos. Takwa's soldiers were terrified as the city erupted in a sea of flames and a gunpowder magazine detonated. The result was a display of anguish, blood and tears just like any war. A small community called Agidingbi, which is an onomatopoeic description of a deafening pounding of landing cannons, was formed by some of the Lagosians who managed to escape the blaze and fled to the northern outskirts of the city. Kusoko and Oshodi Takwa escaped to the eastern part of Lagos. The Royal Navy needed people to spread the news to the remote areas of Lagos that a new force had arrived, so they urged them to flee far from the city. Some important letters, 48 of them between Kusoko and his slave traders, were among the royal belongings that the triumphant invaders led by Commodore Henry Bruce took from Kusoko's abandoned palace. The letters are now being held at the British National Archives. After the bombardment and occupation of Lagos, the British reinstated Akitoye as the King of Lagos. On January 1, 1852, a treaty for the abolition of the slave trade in Lagos was signed between Her Majesty Queen Victoria of England and the King and Chiefs of Lagos. Beyond the desire to end the slave trade, however, was also the economic desire to control the trade of Lagos from which they also hoped to exploit its resources. After the death of Oba Akitoye on September 2, 1853, his son Dosumu succeeded him as king. However, Oba Dosumu could never keep nor suppress the slave trade but would be accused of reviving the slave trade in Lagos. The well-meaning but weak Dosumu was persuaded to cede the ports and island of Lagos in return for a pension. The Oba, afraid that the British might no longer support him, hence allowing the former King Kusoko to strike, gave in to the demands of the British who had threatened to unleash violence on Lagos if Dosumu did not sign the treaty. So, on August 6, 1861, Lagos became a colony of Great Britain. The British colonial authorities then implemented measures to ensure that no harm came to Oba Dosumu. He was given a yearly pension of 1,200 bags of cowries, estimated at £1,000 per year, as long as he abided by the treaty. With the annexation of Lagos, the British then took the next step to conquer the whole of Yoruba land, whose different tribes had been fighting a series of civil wars for 72 years. More about the Yoruba civil wars in our next episode. <laughs>